recording. And we're now recording it as well. And my phone now says two o'clock, so I think we will get started. Kaylin, you're gonna get real special treatment uh, being the only Zoom participant. Hopefully um, our friends on Facebook are, are watching as well. But um, I wanna welcome Amy Alessio back. Um, I think this is the third installment of uh, the cooking series that we're doing. And as you can see by the screen today, Amy's gonna be teaching us all about donuts and dainties. So I'm gonna hand it over to, to you, Amy, and we'll get started. Thanks so much, Samantha. I'm excited to be doing this third show for DeKalb. Um, and next month on August 7th, I'll be talking about international vintage desserts. Uh, so we're covering a lot of sweet ground with these programs. Um, and I like talking about donuts and dainties, especially as we get closer to the fall. Um, so maybe you'll get some recipes and ideas for everything from little sandwiches, cream puffs, petty fours, donuts, and more. So it'll make you hungry. All right, so I give a brief introduction about myself. I am, I was a librarian for 20 years at the Schomburg Township Library. I ran teen programs um, and I was teaching myself how to blog way back when it started. And I used my vintage cookbook collection. I have about 2000 vintage cookbooks. Many of them are pamphlet size, uh, even though I realize in the picture, they're all like book size. And I also collect other vintage kind of things. You see a cookie press there, I have two cookie presses. Uh, an old mixer. Uh, I have uh, different vintage things in my house. I just like things from the past, including uh, mid-century decades, especially. And these are my grandmothers. These are, I think, the reason why I got involved collecting vintage cookbooks. On the left is my grandma, Curtin, who came over from Ireland, and she made everything, clothes, uh, cooking, everything. And she also worked the 3 to 11 shift at the Brock's factory. Uh, and my mother to this day says there are some candies that she can't eat because she would, my grandma would come home with like the ones with mistakes in them. And then she said she, my mom and her sisters would eat too many of them. So I always think that's funny, but uh, she didn't write many recipes down. I have a handful of handwritten recipes for my grandma. Uh, there's fruit cake. There is uh, two types of kolachkis. There's beef brisket for 50 and there's like Irish coffee. It's, it's an interesting mix. On the right is my grandma, Alessio. I kept my name when I got married. Um, and she also didn't write anything down. And I always say that she taught me that bad food is still good memories. She was a wonderful cook. She made like a seven course Easter in her tiny spotless little apartment. Um, and she came from Italy and she uh, really got involved uh, cooking and caring for her family. Um, and so she loved using the library. I remember her telling me all kinds of times about how great the library was. She would walk there in her town. Uh, so I always think, well, maybe that's where I started thinking about libraries for a career. Um, but she would still try to make food in her spotless apartment when she was about 95. She turned 89 seven times at least. She just, every year she turned 89 again. It was her birthday and Christmas. We brought out the cake. We reused the candles because she didn't want to turn 90. So every year it was 89 again. So she was still trying to make her Italian gravy in her apartment and she couldn't see uh, and it was terrible. But I always say I would give anything to have it in that form now. I just, you know, I, you miss people. And even when the food wasn't good, you, you miss them with that contribution. All right, let's start with bread art. In the 1960s, people had people over to play bridge at cocktail parties, tiny, elegant little sandwiches were very popular. And even from the mid to late 50s, we saw a lot of this. This is from the 1958 Good Housekeeping's Breads and Sandwiches uh, cookbook, which is in my collection. Look on the left at all the ways to cook, cut the sandwich. I and mean, that's crazy. Look at that waist, that one where it's like a triangle and then a thing in the middle. Of, who gets the pieces that are like all crust? I mean, it's crazy to think about that. But it gets crazier on the right when you see what they made the sandwiches into. And we see some are cut in like bridge shapes like the spade or the diamond. Um, some are folded like kolachkis on the bottom. Some are, the pinwheels are probably still popular, but people were supposed to do this at home with different types of bread. I mean, it's, it's you would pay a lot of money to go to tea and have fun little sandwiches. And the, these cookbooks think you should make your own. And some of the fillings they suggest are definitely a sign of the times. Uh, there's one called dried beef and cheese, um, which doesn't sound too bad, right? It's a sandwich filling. So it has tomatoes and minced onion uh, and processed cheddar cheese and dried beef, which uh, maybe not terrible. And it adds like egg and butter. The part that I didn't like was pour into a jar 
cool and refrigerate until spreadable. Now that maybe doesn't sound so good. And they also had one called Cannibal Sandwich, which was a layer of chopped raw beef and spices. That's definitely a sign of the times. We would not do that now as a sandwich filling. And here are some more pictures of fancy sandwiches. Um, and these are from my Southern Living, Southern Heritage. Uh, I believe this is Socials and Soirees. That is a series where people got mailed a volume a month as they paid. And it has so much wonderful ephemera and background on different things. There's a volume called Celebrations where I have an entire chapter of Mardi Gras party menus, uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, so here we have mini sandwiches uh, and these look like, again, things we'd pay a lot for a tea. And look at the ones on the right. They use different cutters and different types of bread and put them together. And those are so much fun. Think of the work involved though, right? And then we have Halloween sandwiches. There are some on themes. These make me laugh, the ones on the left. Although I have to say they're awfully cute, those little snowmen. Um, from 230 Tasty Sandwich Recipes, 1969. Uh, it says you can make jack-o'-lantern faces uh, with two types of bread. And that looks kind of fun. Um, and it has a filling that has mayonnaise, cottage cheese, crushed pineapple, chopped dates, and crystallized ginger. That does not sound too bad with uh, brown bread. Um, and I'm amused that they make the cats out of, and I think it's cookies on bread uh, in different uh, form, ways, probably licorice to make that. And you can see the one on the right, they're showing you how to fold and uh, make, I like the one where they scoop out the center and put the filling in the piece of bread. That's a fun way to make an open face sandwich. Uh, so lots of different ways to do it. It's hard to imagine doing all of these or how much time it would take. It's from Southern Heritage, Southern uh, Socials and Soirees. And it says, this is the River Oaks Garden Club Luncheon. Um, and yes, those are cut out chickens on the sandwiches on the bottom on, on chicken salad. <laughs> and I, I laughed I, when I used to do these talks live, I would say, all right, well, who has a chicken cookie cutter? A lot of people had turkeys, very few had chickens. Uh, and it also has, uh, you can see some fun little cucumber sandwiches there on the right. And I like the bread that's rolled up around the asparagus. That's an interesting way to do a sandwich. Uh, just some fun things. Does it look elegant? Sure, it looks like a lot of fun. Would you wanna make those things? Maybe not. Okay, this is one of my favorite recipes. It's gonna be in the packet that Samantha will uh, send out with the survey for today's program. From Betty Crocker Hostess Cookbook, 1967. These are petal tartlets for small afternoon tea. These are a type of open face kolachki. You use the mini muffin pan and you press a flour shaped cook, uh, sugar cookie. And you think, well, all right, well, how do you do that? I slice the roll of the refrigerated dough and then you can trim the edges a little bit to look like scallops and you stick them in the muffin pan and you, can, you bake the cookies and then you add the jelly filling. Some people do it while they're baking. Um, these are a lot of fun and easy to do and something that looks a little bit different. Um, it's sometimes easier than making all the thumbprint cookies or the fold over ones, so. And then how about a card party brunch? This is from Southern Heritage Breakfast and Brunch, and I like how they carry out the theme with the chicken dish there too. This is a pretty ambitious brunch uh, for your card party. It includes tomato juice salad, and you can see it there. To me, that looks like salsa. A bacon and Canadian bacon, which I thought was funny. Look at how thick that Canadian bacon is. A cheese souffle, now that is really getting ambitious for your brunch, although I bet guests would like it. And then they have toasted donuts. This comes up a lot in the vintage cookbook. So they slice regular donuts in half, then you toast them and butter them and eat them. That, uh, <laughs> it does make you wonder why we do that instead of having bagels. Um, that's a lot of extra sugar there. It says fry your donuts until golden brown, turning once. Drain the donuts well on paper towels. Broil four inches from the heating element. So they're not even using the toaster and sprinkle them with powdered sugar. That is an awful lot of work. Um, and I'm not sure why people would probably just like the donuts uh, as they are. So mini cakes and petty fours. And it suggests that you can make all the ones on the left at home. And it also gives you advice on how to cut them into bridge suits. This is from the Betty Crocker cake mix cookbook. So these are made from cake mixes and then they turn them into the petty fours. One on the chocolate one on the left is a chocolate uh, brownie mix. And you can see it's got nuts in it. Then they added like an apricot jelly filling in the middle um, uh, with marshmallow. 
And then it's got chocolate ganache on the top of it. So you can take your cake mixes and make them a little fancier. And then you also see all those cute little pedophores. Look at the adorable pumpkin. Um, and then they have ones cut into different shapes. I like to do pedophores in the diamond shape because it's easy. You take a nine by 13 pan, you cut them into diamonds instead of you know the regular way you would cut a cake into rectangles. Um, there are gonna be triangles along the edges. Maybe you can use those for something else. Then you take your glaze and pour over them when they're separated. Um, that's an easy way to do it and then add decorations. I would like to know how to make those cute little pumpkins though. I love those. Okay, and here's some of my handwritten recipes. I have many boxes of handwritten recipes from people that went on eBay or I found at antique shops. Um, and so this one was tea time treats and I just put a sample of the picture in it. Um, it has a half a cup of butter, a half a cup of sugar, two eggs, two squares of melted chocolate, a cup of, uh, it says chopped nuts and a half cup of cake flour. And then it is a whole teaspoon of salt. There's another sign of a vintage recipe. Not many of us would wanna do that now. Um, and it also has it in question marks, the teaspoon of salt. Um, and we can guess why that is because nobody wants to add that. So, and, and it's just made like a regular mix. So I'm not sure why this is a tea time treat. To me, this seems like a type of brownie. It goes in a nine by nine pan or a little type of bar cookie. Uh, it's just kind of fun. How about yeast rolls? If you haven't tried them, these are kind of fun to do. Actually, my 13 year old is really good at them. People want him to do them for Thanksgiving all the time. This is from 262 exciting breakfast and brunch recipes. Uh, it's got morning coffee twists. Um, and I see a few different things that twist up there. Um, and you can see specific ones there. So they have bow knots. Uh, and some of these you could use package dough and do it. And they form their own crescents there. Um, I like how they do the rolled up, uh, they call them butterflies. Uh, snails is something I hadn't seen before. You do it with three little, um, well, as they did it with strips, but you can, uh, oh, I see it on the bottom. Those are the snails. So lots of fun ways to do these. So they tie them in knots. That's if you're looking to do something a little different with your rolls, uh, something a little fancier, maybe some of these wouldn't be as hard as you think. And of course, there's nothing wrong with plain old biscuits. Um, this is the Better Homes and Gardens home style cooking, as you can see from 1975. Um, I love that huge slab of meat on the right. We don't see that too often on cookbooks now, that huge slab of meat. Uh, or roast. Um, we might see it on a barbecue cookbook, but otherwise you don't see it too much. And I get such a kick out of the two cute deers having their drinks on the left with their petty fours. Um, it does make me think those drinks are alcoholic because they look so happy, but we don't know. Um, it looks like they're having a good time with their petty fours and their cute colored drinks in the summer. Um, and this book also had some great tips on how to make biscuits, which is something I always wanted to do. I had my grandmother's biscuit cutter and it had a little handle and it had a round spot in the middle that you could twist and take out. It was used to cut donuts. Um, so you take it out for biscuits, you put it back in and you can cut donuts. And I had so much fun playing with that thing. Uh, and this book suggests that you don't need a pastry cutter to make biscuits. If you haven't made biscuits before, um, you do need a pastry cutter to put in the butter or the shortening. They suggest you use two knives, which I've done before. It's very clumsy if you haven't done it a lot and it doesn't work that well. So it says it's very easy to use two knives. It isn't. Um, and so, so all biscuits are, in a lot of cases, are flour, baking powder, and salt. And then you add in a little shortening. It says, till the mixture resembles coarse crumbs. Uh, make a well in the center pour in milk and the dough, and then you knead the dough. Um, so these people would make for a lot of different meals, not just breakfast. Uh, and so I enjoyed that, uh, that version of it, although don't use them to chew knives. All right, here's Croak and Bush. I don't know if any of you have watched Crime Scene Kitchen. I've been totally hooked on that show uh, where people uh, look at clues in a kitchen that's been used and try to figure out what's been made. And one of the things was croquembouche. And my 13 year old, I shouted croquembouche when I figured out what it was. He was like, Mom, you know, how do you know this? <laughs> so croquembouche has actually been around for a really long time. And by this, I mean that um, the first one was maybe in the seven, late 1700s from a French pastry chef. Uh, and it became popular as a wedding cake. And so cream puffs, versions of that can be found even as early as the 1500s, which is wild. So these are cream puffs around a cylindrical cone. And a lot of times they have sponge sugar 
around them as decorations. This one is chocolate poured over the top. It is often used at weddings. I see it a lot at the holidays. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and the ones on Crime Scene Kitchen, people did around a styrofoam cone. Some of them did. Uh, and I think that makes a lot of sense rather than trying to just build the cone with the cream puffs. Now I have a taste for those. Okay, you're going to get a recipe for edible Blarney stones. Here's something small that I make, and I don't just make them uh, for St. Patrick's Day, but I add this picture because it's my 100% Irish mother's favorite St. Patrick's Day treat is the green hostess snowball. Uh, and for a while there, we know that hostess uh, wasn't made uh, in Chicago, and they stopped doing the snowballs for a little bit. Uh, and so now they have come back, although they don't have all the colors. It's hard to find purple now at Easter, but you can still find green at both Halloween and St. Patrick's Day. But edible Blarney stones are just cupcakes. So you can make them yourself. You make cupcakes, you don't put them in the little papers. You frost them all the way around, even the bottom and everything. So the entire thing is covered with frosting and then sprinkled with colored coconuts. Uh, and the recipe, the vintage recipe, calls them edible Blarney stones for St. Patrick's Day, but really they could be used for a lot of fun occasions. You could do mini ones, you could do bigger ones and pipe in cream in the middle like the hostess snowballs. Um, and speaking of the hostess snowballs, they've actually been around since 1947. Uh, so with the rationing of flour and sugar during World War II, they were an instant hit with Americans. Uh, and this is from their website, of course. Uh, and so it was white marshmallow and shredded coconut over chocolate cakes. They didn't add the cream filling until a few years later. And then um, they originally were in a package with one white and one pink. And then they started adding the different colors. And another hostess small treat. Oh, I don't know why that picture is so blurry on the right. Um, is the hostess Twinkie. And these have been around since 1930. Um, a gentleman who worked for hostess invented it because they wanted to make a better use of their shortcake pans. Now imagine in Chicago, they wouldn't have fresh strawberries that easily uh, year round, especially uh, during those times when uh, you know times are very hard for people. So they decided to make golden cakes with banana filling. So the classic ones have banana in them. And every once in a while, they will bring back the classic banana. I know they try all kinds of combinations now. I've seen orange Twinkies, chocolate with vanilla cream, different uh, things. And you can look at this ad is not uh, particularly good. <laughs> it's not an ad we'd see today where the Twinkies are so good it punches out all the characters. That is not really a good advertisement, I don't think. Um, and so I have a... Uh, for, there was a fun fact on the hostess website was that 89 year old Lewis Browning of Shelbyville, Indiana has been eating a minimum of one Twinkie a day since 1941, consuming more than 22,000 in his lifetime. That, uh, that's crazy. <laughs> and then you see lots of variations, Twinkies, as I said now for a while there, it was huge to see them at fairs and deep fry. Since we are deep in fair season now, DuPage County Fair is coming up. I know DuCalv, uh, County, I think, is this weekend, or Kane County is this weekend, DuPage is next weekend. Um, deep fried Oreos and Twinkies and things. Let's take something that's already incredibly, uh, you know, filled with unhealthy things and make it worse. Although I have tasted it, it's not bad. It's just not something you eat and think, oh, this would be so much better fried. Uh, from Cookie Cookery, 1969, cake crumb bars. These use four and a half cups of flour. Uh, oatmeal, shortening raisins, and three cups of cake crumbs. And these are the ones on the left. So it says, these cake crumbs are the crumblings of leftover cakes or a few day old cookies. Now I live in a house with two teenage boys. I don't have a whole lot of leftover cakes or cookies in my home and definitely not enough to make three cups of crumbs. But it says you can dry the crumbs in a baking pan in a warm oven, roll them into crumbs and store them in jars. And then you make cake crumb bars. Um, you know, a lot of the old cookbooks, they were make do, they didn't waste a thing. And that goes back to depression and wartime eras. Uh, and it's kind of fun to see it, although I don't know that I want to go that far. On the right, from a 1947 cookie book called 250 Cookie and Small Cake Recipes. These are nut toasties. It says it's a clever cook who can turn bread into cookies, but it is simple enough when you know how. Okay, but why? So these are essentially... Uh, French toast sticks. They dip them in uh, egg and milk and then they fry them in hot deep fat and it says and you can sometimes pipe jam in the middle of them. Um, 
you know, it says this is a good thing to do with kids. Nothing with the hat fad is a good idea. But these little cakes look like lots of fun. These are from McCall's series, Do It Yourself Party Book. Uh, these are pedophores, and you can see there's all kinds of different styles going around the page. And uh, some of these recipes would be included uh, in the pack in the uh, with the survey. And so some of these remind me of the edible Blarney stone. You can see the snowballs covered with coconuts like uh, down at the bottom near the center. Or look at the jelly blob in the upper left. That's what I call it, the jelly blob, because uh, that looks like something I could do, or even the chocolate shavings. So there's lots of these, they look daunting all together. Um, and remember, this is from the do-it-yourself party book. There's no way I would do this all myself before a party. But there are some combinations that would work uh, and not be too hard. Now, some of these maybe aren't as popular anymore. Definitely the butterscotch mincemeat would be an acquired taste. But some of these, like the diamond that has walnuts on the edge of it, might be possible to make yourself. You can take little tips from some of these and start making your own pedophores. You know, just take that nine by 13 and chop it up and then use some of these fun little decorating tips. How about using small cakes as a wedding cake? So we know that cupcakes in the 90s just kind of like exploded into popularity and sometimes people were making fancy ones and there were cupcake baking shops and there's still a few of those around. And then there people were doing wedding cakes out of cupcakes. Well, you do find it in the vintage cookbook, some of these kind of tips. These are from Betty Crocker's cake mix cookbooks again. I love the one on the left. Uh, it's got like three stages. There's the engagement heart cake, the mini wedding cakes, and those are made with Oreos and like smaller wafer cookies. And then you pour the frosting over them so they look like mini wedding cakes. And then there's the umbrella for the baby shower. So it's got, you know, the whole life cycle is, is all right there. <laughs> Uh, and they look pretty good. And on the right is a petty for wedding cake. It says, this is an easy way of serving a wedding cake um, as individual pettifors. The tiered cake is unusual and the little cakes eliminate any cutting problem. So it occurs to me after COVID that a lot of things will be served in little easy, um, like individual helpings where people don't have to touch each other. So it'll be very easy to serve. And that one's awfully cute. It'd be a lot of work for sure to make a petty four uh, wedding cake, just like the cupcake ones it would take a lot of work, but uh, how lovely and how fun to get your own mini cake. From Better Homes and Gardens, Pies and Cakes says for a smooth icing on your petty fours, place the cakes on rack over a cookie sheet. All right, to pick up the spill, pour the icing evenly over cakes and you can keep the icing over hot water, like in a double boiler to make it smooth. Uh, and you can see they're doing diamond shaped ones there. And that's an easy way to do it. And they turn out better than you'd think. Obviously, a lot of my recipes do not turn out perfectly. Uh, some, I like things that are easy to do, that are satisfying. And I like how they're offered on the right. And the suggestion is honor a bride or a sweet 16 young lady with a pretty pink party. You know, this almost 50 year old young lady would love a pretty pink party with these little cakes. Although I don't know, I'd want the massive ice cream thing in the center. It'd be hard to serve. Um, and I really wonder how they got that photo. Did they put it in there and then race over to take the picture before it melted? Because almost nothing is melted on there. Or was it a really cold room? These are things that I worry about when I look at these pictures. But uh, ice cream and pedophores would be a lot of fun, but the ice creams maybe could be in individual dishes. But the pink pedophores with little sugar roses in the middle um, are awfully cute. All right, here we go. Here's some cupcake things. Uh, and there's a cupcake wedding cake uh, I found on Pinterest on the left. And it's beautiful, right? Uh, the top layer goes to the bride and groom, I think, to take home to their first anniversary. And then you see uh, those are cupcakes underneath. Um, how would you bite into that? A lot of people I know would take off the flour or they would peel off the fondant. Um, and so they look wonderful, but there is a lot of appeal towards about the cupcakes on the right too. And those are from the 1956 Good Housekeeping Cake Book. And it says you can make these yourself. Uh, yes, these look a little easier than the pedophores one I showed you. But, and again, we have some edible Blarney stones. Uh, as you can see, snowballs on there. One has pink icing with coconut around it and the other has chocolate icing with coconut. Uh, I love the cherries one made with uh, candied cherries or the, even the face one has some charm. 
But I always think that the person making these got tired by the time they got to the bottom, because look at that half and half one that is just like glued together with some frosting. Not sure that's as easy. <laughs> so different ways of making them. All right, what about mini cheesecakes? You see this a lot in the 60s, and actually it comes up as a recipe for cocktail parties, oddly enough. There's different ways to do these. I um, mean, actually, if you like uh, mysteries with recipes, the Joanne Fluke series has one with the mini cherry cheesecakes. It's a whole theme of the book. Um, the way I like to do it is a vanilla wafer in a cheesecake paper, and then you put the cheesecake mix on top of it, and then you add whatever kind of toppings. This is another one that I think is going to get really big again in the post-COVID uh, holiday world because people are going to be wanting the individual portions that they can just pick up easily. Um, and while at first was popular to make them with cherries on top, there's all kinds of ways you can do it. I've tied them green and put uh, crushed candy canes on top or uh, chocolate chips on top. I've done chocolate and peanut butter versions. I've done a layer of crushed Oreos on the bottom or even an Oreo cookie and then poured the cheesecake on top. Lots of different ways to do it. Um, and while it's not a, a little recipe, this picture also has the poke cake because the cheesecake mixes from Jello, and that's actually the one that I use when I make these. Um, and the poke cake, I just like to mention it because a lot of people like it, uh, where you have the a cake in the oven and you poke holes with a dowel rod and then you can pour the fruit jello over the top. But a lot of people like to do it with the pudding while the cake is still warm, you do that. So that's something that comes and goes in popularity. Uh, so we'll have to see if that'll be popular again this year. Okay, from Betty Crocker's Good and Easy, 1954. What is the fourth meal? For breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you eat the things you think you should eat, but in between you eat the things you like. I don't wanna think how many meals I get up to in a day then because, uh, or my family. Um, but this also, and keep in mind that it's called good and easy, suggests the mitered tablecloths to pull out for your bridge parties. So somebody made those to the exact measurements of those tables and added that trim. Uh, there's nothing good or easy <laughs> about making those. I like to sew, but that is more work than I like to do. Nothing that requires that kind of measurement. Does it look pretty? Sure, it does. Uh, when's the last time you've seen a miter tablecloth? I can't even think of one. I definitely don't own any. And then on the right, uh, it's, this is a picture of morning coffees. It says it's a tradition from Europe that came over to the South when, and they brought fancy coffee cakes. And it says, blueberry is very common in both vintage times and now. From Duncan Hines' 1979 bake shop in a book, they have blueberry donuts, blueberry peach coffee cake, and blueberry fruit crunch. Uh, that is, a, according to the, if we're going by the meals for the things we want to eat, that's about four different meals there, I think. So blueberry donuts have become more and more popular again. I see them at all the donut places, and I didn't used to. It used to be like a seasonal thing, but now you see a lot of people. Uh, and definitely this is a good time of year to make something with donuts. All right, donut diplomacy from the Betty Crocker picture cookbook, which is one of the few cookbooks that's really worth money. And by money, I mean like $25 if you were gonna sell it on eBay. Certain cookbooks have regional interest. Uh, the Antoinette Pope cookbook is one in Illinois and Chicago area that people would pay a little more money for because they have memories of it because she had that cooking school here. But the Betty Crocker cookbook is another one that people love. Uh, and you can sort of see why here. See all the nice pictures of each step, right? It's like watching YouTube uh, before YouTube. We get all the different tips here. And so they have a donut diplomacy, how to make these properly and not overdo it. Uh, and you can see these are a lot of work to fry them. Uh, I wonder how the air fryer does with donuts. I have not tried that yet, but one thing I have done is baked donuts. Uh, I have a baked donut pan. It is so easy. Uh, and while they're not health food, obviously they are better than the fried ones. Um, and some of the steps here include uh, on the fried ones, keep the fat to reuse. Again, they didn't waste. Uh, clarify the fat with a raw potato in it to keep it uh, clear. And then when fat bubbles, strain it into the jar or can it through two or three thicknesses of cheesecloth or over a wire strainer. It's a lot of work. Um, it says known in England in, 19, in 1536 as imported doughy cakes, donuts were brought to this country by Dutch and English settlers. 
originally balls or nuts of yeast dough, the Yankees found a quicker way. They were popular with soldiers of the Revolutionary War, as well as with the doughboys of World War I or the GIs of World War II. They are hearty and heartening. And I was reading that and thinking, but bad for your heart. All right, here's another small delicacy. And this is from my Farm Journal's Great Home Cooking in America. And it covers a lot of ethnic recipes. And the Farm Journal is a series that I love to collect, uh, like the Southern Heritage, Southern Living. The Farm Journals are usually no nonsense with ingredients that you might have at home. Uh, and they're a lot of fun. They do occasionally deviate from that though. You'll see something with like quantity for 50 that they want you to sell. Um, I saw there was a whole chapter on advice on how to have a luau in an Illinois or Indiana farm, which they said was a great suggestion because you'd already have a pig. You could dig a big trench in your yard. It is funny, but the farm journal mostly is no nonsense, the kind of things that you'd have already. And so they suggest Ali Ballin which is an unusual donut filled with apples and raisins, uh, served in Holland during the holidays and always on New Year's Eve. Uh, so you, these are, and you can see they have lots of raisins, they've got some fruit in it. Um, so maybe a different version of like a fruit cake, which would not be hard or made for months with alcohol basting it like a traditional fruit cake. Um, these seem to me like a fried fruit cake because these are fried. And they refer to them as sweet donuts and say they should be served with great pictures of milk and fresh brewed coffee. On New Year's Eve, I could see that you might need the coffee. And how about regular donuts? Tons of recipes for regular donuts and all kinds of varieties. And there seem to be trends that people tried. There's a couple of things I wanna point out about this picture though. This is from the 1959 uh, Better Homes Holiday Cookbook. Uh, I love how they included the spice jars for color on the table and how the gingerbread cookies are running on apple stands. Pay attention to the uh, cake in the upper, it's a spice cake near the running gingerbread men. They call that uh, over easy egg cake because it's supposed to look like an egg on top of toast. Uh, and that's not a mini treat to go with today's theme, it's just in that picture. And I wanted to mention it, that uses uh, cream cheese and pear on top of the gingerbread or spice cake, and those flavors probably work very well together. But here they had uh, spice donuts, uh, and they suggest serving them over fall days. And you can see they've got cinnamon ones and a lovely uh, warmed apple cider there. Uh, lots of fun things to make here. And then there's also varieties from Southern Heritage, Southern Living breads uh, and donuts. Look at the pan to make the donuts over the fire. That would take forever. <laughs> I can't imagine camping and wanting to make donuts. It's crazy. Uh, but one of the things they mentioned in here reminded me of something my grandma Curtin did is they use potato flakes in their donut dough for the ones in the middle, especially. It does make it extra fluffy. That's something she did. Although I think she used actual potato. Uh, just a different way to do it. You know, people, especially during ration times had to be creative. Look at the cast iron donut baker though. I, that, it's just there's one behind too uh, that you make them in that pan. Uh, so other ways other than frying that people did it. All right, and then there's the Jiffy version. And I used to laugh about these in, the, in, in a nostalgic way, the way we used to laugh about bell bottoms, you know. I mean, I had some, I thought they were very stylish, uh, but now I would laugh about them and here, there is, although they do come and go in different ways in fads. Um, and so in the nostalgic way, I laughed at some of these donut recipes, although I always run into people at programs who's done them this way. Um, again, from uh, this one is from Mary Mead's country cookbook. Uh, Mary Mead was the food editor of the Chicago Tribune. And she said, make your donuts with applesauce um, or cut miniature donuts or make twists by tying strips of dough in a knot and frying them. Uh, and also they have a quick way to make them here from the Better Homes and Gardens Holiday Cookbook, 1959. It says warm up after the game with coffee, donuts, and jiffy. So they're using refrigerated biscuits or ones made with jiffy mix and they poke a hole in the center. So you've got your refrigerated biscuits, you poke a hole in the center, uh, you fry them, you cover them with confectioner's sugar and it's like an instant donut or you can make them as jelly-filled donuts. It says take two refrigerated biscuits, 
and flatten them to a quarter of an inch. Place one teaspoon of jelly on half of the biscuits, cover with the other one, seal the edges and fry. It's hard to imagine. I don't think the ones in the center have been made with the biscuit the way they suggest, but they said they did. All right, how about the Halloween dough berry? Um, this is from the Complete Holiday Cookbook. And this cookbook has some very unusual holiday themes. Uh, they have a crown roast of frankfurters, which actually is a depression era recipe. Uh, and you can, it makes more sense in depression era, but why it's suggesting it in a 1960 cookbook for Halloween, I don't know, although it is scary. A crown roast of frankfurters with sauerkraut in the middle, but I did not include that here. Uh, here we're talking about donuts and they have uh, funny face donuts. And you can see them in the lower right part of that picture. And these are donuts that are cut in half again, although we're not toasting them this time. They're cut in half like the width way. And then you take the cranberry sauce out of the can, which is chilled and sliced thin. You can see where I'm going with this and packaged cheese slices. It says place the donut half cut side up on the plate, top with the cranberry sauce slice. Cut eyes, nose and mouth from cheese slices. Make uh, like hair and hats from construction paper or foil. Uh, there's so many other ways you could do this. I like the cheese uh, on top of a bagel and you could make faces out of it. It's hard to imagine putting cranberry and then, you know, I bet it looks pretty, the red and the orange on the fall table, but who would wanna eat that? From Southern Living's Our Best Recipes, 1970, they have donut goblins. And so they say, take a dozen small round gumdrops, plain donuts, and three ring gumdrops. Let's see if you can follow this. Cut six round gumdrops in half and arrange as eyes on the donuts. Place a whole round gumdrop over the center of each donut for the nose. Cut ring gumdrops in half and then cut jagged edge with a paring knife to represent teeth. Place on the donuts in the position of the mouth. No picture is provided. A whole genre of what I call gumdrop art, especially in the 60s. I had one where it advised me to roll a gumdrop with a rolling pin and then tie it in a bow. And this was a time-saving recipe on how to use cake mixes. That's crazy. Can you make goblin faces on donuts? Absolutely. And we see a lot of companies come out with like monster donuts. They leave them intact and then decorate the outside of them. I just thought that was funny. I have a hard time following their directions even. Easier Donuts, that's my name for them. From 1954, uh, Betty Crocker's Good and Easy. Light, crispy donuts used to be a real test for the skilled cook. Now they're quick and easy if you have an automatic fryer. Uh, and here again, they're making them out of Bisquick. Uh, I talked about Jiffy, so not here again, but here now they are talking about Bisquick. Uh, and they still want you to fry them. That is not easy. It says fry one minute on a side. I don't know if you've ever tried making donuts the traditional way. It's not easy. They don't always rise uh, the way they're supposed to. I would love to see like air fryer ones. It'll be interesting to see how air fryer changes the way so many popular things are cooking. Things that the vintage folks would never have imagined. And how about crullers and fritters? You can see the caption here is tender crullers and free form fruit filled pineapple fritters. That is not easy to say. Our most appetizing with cups of hot coffee. So there's all kinds of fritter vegetable recipes uh, and they are suggested to be served with dinner. So I've had like, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think, I know I've had carrot uh, fritters and there's been a uh, worse ones. So all kinds of different vegetables and then fried up and served as brunch or breakfast that obviously does not count as a fruit or vegetable. Uh, the thing with crullers, they use kneading and less shortening and you still fry them. So I'm thinking the crullers are in front and the fritters are on the left. And on the East Coast, you'll find a lot of um, seafood fritters uh, served in uh, fast food type places. All right, Victory Dinner. This is one of the first cookbooks I collected, Square Meals by Jan and Michael Stern. They do a whole series on Route 66 food uh, and Square Meals was based on other like really vintage cookbooks. It was like the precursor towards the type of thing I wanted to do. So they really studied like wartime cookbooks and they made funny comments. The whole thing, the whole cookbook read like a novel and it did have good recipes in it too. And they found a recipe for interlinked donuts uh, for a victory dinner. 
uh, and you make them interlinked for the US Navy. Uh, and it says, cut out, the, oh, mix the dough and roll the donuts to three quarter inch thick. Cut them out with a standard cutter. Let them stand on the board for a few minutes. Now here's where it's hard. Make diagonal slits with a knife in half the donuts. Slip a cut donut through a whole one, moisten the ends and press together. Okay, so that's interlocking rings. Not, not terrible to figure that one out. Fry until golden brown a few pairs at a time, about two and a half minutes in deep fat at almost 400 degrees. As soon as they rise to the top of the fat, pull them apart slightly so the two interlinked donuts will not stick together. That doesn't sound easy. Um, it makes 20 pairs and an extra donut. I like how it gives you that information because these are good for uh, Navy folks. Well, some more donut ideas if you want to make some at home. And again, I advise the baked ones are a lot of fun. From New Sunbeams Cooker and Deep Fryer, 1952. Uh, it says you can ice donuts with chocolate, orange, or vanilla. Uh, orange donuts come up over and over in the cookbooks. Uh, orange flavor, I'm sure for the fall and people are cold and eating the warm donuts. Um, it says you can fry the centers of donuts and sprinkle with sugar and donuts and kids will love them. Yes, everybody likes donut holes. If you're in a hurry, drop the dough by heaping spoon fills into the preheated shortening. Slide it off with a rubber scraper. It's so much quicker than rolling. So you would have kind of uh, maybe misshapen lumps instead of uh, regular donuts. And so here's some other things they suggested. I talked about frying the centers. Uh, to reheat them, split them in half and toast them. That's another of their suggestions. Um, and then glaze, uh, glaze and then coconuts or just have sprinkled sugar around them. And there's Aunt Jenny and Spry. A lot of, many of us think of Crisco now for shortening, but there was also Aunt Jenny's. In 1936, uh, the Lever brothers introduced Spry vegetable shortening as a competitor to Crisco. And you can tell how well that has turned out, although uh, it was popular for a long time. And so they had this character they used in advertising called Aunt Jenny. She was a slightly plump grandmotherly woman um, with bright white hair, thin spectacles, and an ever-present baking apron. Her demeanor was sweet, kind, helpful, and almost bizarrely enthusiastic, especially regarding her home cooking and spry in particular. Um, so she had a radio show called Aunt Jenny's Real Life Stories, which made its debut in CBS on January 18, 1937. Uh, this is from uh, I think this is a foodtimeline.org. I get a lot of my uh, great food tips there. So we're going to take a look at Aunt Jenny's ad here. It says on the left, it says, how did you ever decide what recipes to put in this book of yours, Jenny? Why, you must know thousands. Well, Calvin, I knew folks would want recipes and they receipts was recipes for every day, not too fussy or hard on the pocketbook, but good tasting. See, they made her folksy. It's amazing to think she had a popular radio show too. This the character, the person they hired to be the character. I like the ones on the right. Your cookbook is the grandest wedding gift, Aunt Jenny. And here's a big three pound can of Spry to start off housekeeping. Oh boy. And so she says, I'm so proud of, proud of my Spry cake. So light and delicate and velvety and mixed in a jiffy. Oh, mixed in a jiffy. Spry's so wonderfully creamy. I love to use it. And shows her with her husband saying marvelous fritters so crisp and tender so not only did she make a cake that week she also made fritters this is a busy lady it says boy isn't the pie crust oh and she made a pie too tender and flaky you're a grand little cook thank aunt jenny and spry so aunt jenny gave them a three pound can of spry and while you might think that sounds like a lot at the rate she's baking it will probably not take that long to go through that Shortening is, is messy. A lot of people don't like to use it. Obviously, it's very unhealthy and it's a pain to use, right? It's incredibly messy. It gets everywhere. I love it in the stick form. The Crisco stick form is terrific. You cut off what you need, you add it to your dough. And here's some whoopie pies. For a long time, Oreos had whoopie pies uh, and they were called, and of course, oh, cakesters. I don't know if you remember that. They, they've disappeared now for the last few years, but they used to have cakesters and all kinds of flavors. And here it was back in 2007, they made a giant one for their 95th birthday. And 
and it was uh, it was like a sample of what's known as whoopie pies. Now the origin of whoopie pies, and whoopie pies are pretty popular now. Most people know what they are. Um, it's one of the most popular pans that Wilton has. Somebody who worked at Wilton told me this. So it's like thick cookies that are rounded on top and then a thick filling in the middle. And you'll probably find that your library has cookbooks just on whoopie pies. I've seen ones that have savory. These are not just like cakey cookies. I've seen savory ones made with cornbread and like a jalapeno filling. I'll tell I'm about to get hoarse. Uh, but whoopie pies have been around. The origin is from Amish uh, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. But a dirty mower who invented marshmallow fluff uh, claims that they invented the whoopie pies. A lot of times, well, brands will claim ownership of something popular because they want to be associated with it. Like Carol Syrup claims they invented pecan pies, and they did not. Durkee Mower also invented the fluffer nutter, which is the sandwich with peanut butter and marshmallow fluff. But they are a lot of whoopie pie recipes do use marshmallow fluff on their filling because it has a lot of body. It's able to hold those cookies together. <clears throat> Here are some of my baked donuts. Some that my boys made. One's on the left, uh, they called Yoda donuts because they were made, uh, we dyed them green and we used uh, ground up graham crackers in them to give them a bit more body. We were experimenting. Uh, and that recipe will be included. And then the ones on the right uh, were also baked. And you can see we added some pineapple ones. We made a chocolate glaze for some of them. Uh, my sons called them Hawaiian uh, O-nuts because they had the hole in the middle and they had pineapple and coconut on them. So baked ones are pretty easy and they only take about 10 or 12 minutes to bake uh, as opposed to the fried ones. But just like with the whoopie pies, the vintage cookbooks tried to show that Donuts were not just for dessert. Uh, and Marvelous Muffins and Pied Piper Donuts are from the Cooking with Condensed Soups, uh, one of Campbell's product cookbooks from the 1950s. Um, and a big hallmark of Midwest church cookbooks is condensed soups. I mean, you can't go without finding like cream of mushroom, cream of celery, those kind of, these are really popular in the Midwest cookbooks. Well, here Campbell's was trying to make savory donuts for dinner or savory muffins. And so the marvelous muffins have cream of mushroom or cream of chicken soup in them and shortening um, to make for your dinner. I think those would probably taste already, especially chicken noodle soup. I don't want to try it, but I don't know that it, you know, it's, it's an odd thing to include for dinner. But the Pied Piper donuts, I definitely don't want to make. These have tomato soup and cinnamon and nutmeg. Now I have made tomato soup cake and it's like a spice cake. It's just harder for me to imagine it fried up for donuts. Um, it's a little maybe strong, but you're supposed to serve it as a side dish for dinner in their cookbooks. From New Recipes for Good Eating, 1949, they have mashed potato donuts. Remember how I mentioned that that was popular. That's a trend that goes way back. So they use two tablespoons of Crisco, egg, milk, sifted flour, baking powder, salt, sugar, a cup of mashed potatoes, and not the flakes, actual mashed potatoes. Uh, it says blend the Crisco egg and milk. Mix your flour, baking powder, powder, salt, and sugar. Combine two mixtures with mashed potatoes and mix thoroughly. Uh, these make them very fluffy. And then after they're fried, they dip them in powdered sugar. You can see they're very popular with the two kids on the cover. Now, do these count as donuts? Here's another one from New Recipes for Good Eating 1949. Fried noodle rings uh, arranged in a donut shape. Now you do see this a lot into the 1950s. There's all kinds of luncheons with these as a base and a scoop of chicken salad on top or salmon. Uh, you see like the salmon ring uh, and served on round. There's all kinds of variations of that on the 50s. So these are made with fine dry noodles, salt, and then you fry them in Crisco. How do you get them? Oh, you place in greased individual ring molds uh, after the, the noodles are made. Chill until firm. I wondered how they got it to hold that shape. Uh, remove from the ring molds and then fry in the Crisco. I don't, <laughs> that, is, uh, that is a lot of work for no good reason. All right. Do you have a favorite flavor of donut? In the fall, we see a lot of pumpkin, coconut, and apple cider. In the summer, I'm seeing a lot more of blueberry. I've seen all kinds of fun summery flavors. So 
Um, that is all I have on donuts and dainties. And I'll see if we had any questions uh, or if you want to share any favorite donuts or recipes that you've had. All right, Nayla, did you have any questions for Amy or did you want to share any, any information? No, this was a lovely presentation. I'm oh. <laughs> really glad I got to be a part of this and, and um, hear you kind of go over this. This is really interesting stuff and I wouldn't Thank have you. been able to hear about it otherwise. Thank you so much. I hope there's enough in there that people actually want to eat, not the, uh, the fried noodle rings or the... <laughs> It all sounded good to me. <laughs> well, <laughs> I definitely, I would like trying some savory muffins, but maybe not with the condensed soups. I don't know. It'd be interesting to try. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. Yeah. Um, Kaylin, I, I uh, emailed you the recipe packet that Amy put together, and then um, I put the link to our feedback survey in the chat function if you want to um, take a few minutes to fill that out. But if we don't have any further questions for Amy, I think we can, we can let you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank Thanks. you. All right, Amy. Thank you for, for presenting again, and um, we'll see you next month. Thank you so much, Sam. Take right. care. Have a good day. Bye.